So very happy to have uh, Ramya Sharifi, uh, who will give his first lecture on modular curves and cyclotomic fields. Okay, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, we good? Okay, great. So uh, let me just outline what I'm going to do in the uh, four talks. Okay, so the first one, uh, I'm just going to talk about basic results on in the Iwasawa theory. of cyclotomic fields. So in the second talk, I'm going to do something a little. So I, I designed the four talks, hopefully, so that they're somewhat independent. So if, for instance, the proof of the main conjecture in the second talk, uh, sketch of proof of the main conjecture in the second talk is too much, come back for the third. <laughs> Uh, so in the third, I'm going to talk about cut products of cyclotomic units. And in the fourth, I'm going to talk about relationship between those and modular symbols. OK, so that's the plan. OK. Great. Uh, OK, so today let me start. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to allow p to be any prime just for simplicity. I'm going to try to focus everything on uh, f mu p. Uh, uh, sorry, q mu p. f is q mu p for an odd prime p. and. Uh, Okay. Well, try to be too general. Okay, so uh, the object we're interested in here uh, is the p part of the class group of F, which you can think of. There's different ways to write this. I mean, we could take the class group and tensor it with ZP. That'll give us the P C low subgroup. Uh, so, um, definition, uh, a prime is regular if uh, P doesn't divide the class number. So that means that the P part of the class group is zero. Uh, so, uh, and otherwise, we say it's irregular. So uh, for example, the, the smallest irregular prime is uh, 37. Uh, it's actually known there are infinitely many irregular primes, but not infinitely many regular primes, although um, there should be. OK, so uh, I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, OK, so let's just think of q bar as sitting inside c, and q and f is sitting in q bar. So, uh, so we have tau, which is a complex conjugation. Okay, so uh, right, the Galois group of uh, f over q uh, contains the restriction of this complex conjugation, uh, which corresponds somehow to minus one in, in, in the isomorphism with z mod p z cross, and so we can break uh, a f because p is odd uh, up as a direct sum of uh, two submodules uh, on which complex conjugation acts by one and by minus one, right? So uh, AF is AF plus plus AF minus, uh, where AF plus minus equals A in AF such that tau a equals plus or minus a. OK, so, uh, so results that date back to Coomer in the mid-1800s. Uh, first, uh, AF is 0 
uh, if and only if AF minus is zero. Uh, okay. And, and the second is uh, actually a conjecture. Uh, and that is that uh, AF plus is zero. And this is called Van der Waals conjecture. It was rediscovered in the early 1900s. Uh, so, so this is actually known uh, for a large number of primes. In fact, uh, Bueller and Harvey in 2009 uh, showed that it's true for p less than uh, 39 times 2 to the 22, which is about something greater than 163 million. Uh, but still, we don't know it uh, in general. Um, the number of exceptions up to p should be something like log log p. OK, so um, if, if it's not true, <laughs> which it could very well be true. OK, so uh, right. So how do we tell if a number is irregular or not? So we can look at Bernoulli numbers, which uh, Bn, so we can define this as the nth derivative at zero of the function uh, x over e to the x minus one. That won't be so useful, except to tell you that uh, the Bernoulli numbers vanish for uh, odd n greater than one, so it's the even ones that are interesting. Uh, so I won't write that as a fact, but uh, let me write some other facts. So uh, they appeared in the last talk. Uh, in the following sense, zeta of 1 minus n is minus bn over n for uh, n greater than or equal to 1. Okay. Um, second is if, uh, say, vp is the p-adic valuation, then um, vp of bn is less than 0. So this is irrational numbers. Right in general, so it could be less than zero if and only if it's uh, um, well n is zero mod p minus one, in which case it's the valuation is minus one. Okay, and the third one is that uh, they satisfy congruences, so which is helpful in constructing the p-adic L function. Uh, a simple example of this is if n is uh, congruent to m and they're not zero mod p minus one. Then, um, then Bn over n is congruent to Bm over m mod p. OK. So uh, in particular, if I, wanna ask, if I ask you, you know, whether p divides a Bernoulli number over n, it, really I only need to look at those which are less than p, or less than p minus, p minus 1. OK. So, uh, OK, so then there's the analytic class number formula. Let me just mention some consequences uh, of the, which I won't mention what the formula is. So, so uh, first is how do we tell if a prime is irregular, right? So, uh, oh. Correct a typo. Not zero. If minus is not zero, if and only if, uh, P divides one of these Bernoulli numbers. Since we're looking at Bernoulli numbers less than, with the index less than P, or I don't need to worry about the denominators. Uh, right. So if and only if P divides this product, B2, B4. Oh, sorry. I'll put in B4, only taking even ones. OK, uh, right. So then uh, examples, as I was mentioning, 37 is the smallest irregular prime. So it divides the 32nd Bernoulli number. Uh, well, so it divides the 32nd Bernoulli number, 67, uh, 59. Here we are. And uh, the, actually, the numerators of the Bernoulli numbers over n are all 1 um, up to 12. So. Uh, 12th Bernoulli number is divisible by 691. OK, so should go. 
Okay, so, right. So second fact is that um, the order of the plus part, which is conjecturally zero, is the p part, in fact, this, we don't need p parts for this, but talking about p parts, of the index of the cyclotomic units in the units, or I could say EF here, I'll take it to be uh, the p units. So what do I mean by that? The ring of integers is z mu p. If I invert p, I get the p integers, and then I take the units, p units. It doesn't make any difference for the index. And CF will be the cyclotomic p units. So those are those p units generated by powers of 1 minus, I mean, 1 minus p through roots of unity. So i is between 1 and p minus 1. Uh, so these are cyclotomic p units. OK, so uh, great. So this is what I can, we can say so far, uh, well, I can say a little more, but about the, the plus and minus parts of the class group. But there's actually a finer decomposition. I only used minus 1 uh, or complex conjugation in this Galois group. What if I use the whole Galois group? What can I uh, say? What does it mean for p to divide one of these Bernoulli numbers? So, uh, so if I let delta be the Galois group of f over q, Right. Um, this is isomorphic to z mod p z cross via the action of Galois and the pth roots of unity. Uh, so let me write down a composition. So I look at how Galois, what power Galois element a raises a pth root of unity to. That gives me an element mod p. And then I can think of this as a p minus first root of unity inside uh, the p adic numbers. So that gives us a map from delta to z p cross. Uh, and uh, call that omega. And um, AF uh, breaks up, so this lifts the canonical reduction, um, as a direct sum of p minus 1 different what I'll call eigenspaces for the action of delta. Uh, AFI and they only matter mod p minus 1 because the order of omega is p minus 1. AFI is the set of A in AF such that delta A is omega delta to the I A for all delta in delta. Okay? Um, so we have these p minus 1 different eigenspaces, uh, and the plus and minus parts break up. Uh, as direct sums of some of these eigenspaces. The plus correspond, the plus part is the direct sum of the AFI for uh, even I, and the minus part is the direct sum of the AFI for odd I. Okay, uh, so we could in fact consider, right, so that's fine. Um, okay, so let me state a theorem. Okay, so the theorem of uh, Herbond and uh, Ribbit, two separate theorems. Uh, Herbond is from Herbond's theorem is from 1932, and Ribbit's is from 1976. And and that is that um, uh, if k and z is even, oh maybe uh, greater than or equal to two, because the way I'm phrasing it, then um, then p divides bk if and only if the 1 minus k or p minus k eigenspace of af is non-zero. OK, so uh, uh, Herbon proved uh, right goes to left, and Ribbit proved left goes to right. Um, right, so let me say a few words. Um, there's actually a stronger version of this that's a consequence of the proof of the main conjecture of Iwasawa theory, uh, or the consequence of the main conjecture. Uh, Mazur Wiles gave a formula for the exact order, um, the order of AF1 minus K, 
is, uh, is p to the p-adic valuation of a certain generalized Bernoulli number, where uh, this actually has a simple formula, so I could just write it, write it down. Uh, 1 over p sum a equals uh, uh, 1 to p minus 1 uh, a omega to the k minus 1. And, and you might say this has nothing to do with that, but again, we have a congruence. So VP is the p-adic valuation. Yeah. Oh, is it too small? Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the definition there on the right. And, and the key point is it, it may not be BK over K, but it is congruent mod P. So P will divide it. It's, it's the correct number if I actually want to get the order rather than just taking BK over K. It's a p-adic number, but we can take its p-adic valuation. OK, so uh, what Herbron did actually is he proved that this number B1 omega to the K minus 1 annihilates I, I mean, this is a consequence of Stickelberger's theorem, actually. It annihilates this eigenspace of the class group. And what Ribbit did, and we'll talk about his method next time, is that he constructed an unramified uh, P extension, abelian P extension of F, uh, that comes from the, it, it sits inside the fixed field of the kernel of the, of the Galois representation attached to a cusp form that satisfies the congruence with an Eisenstein series. I mean, the key point here is that the, the, the constant coefficient of this Eisenstein series is this Bernoulli number over two. Uh, and, uh, or, well, no, just Bernoulli, one of these Bernoulli numbers, let's say, over something. And, uh, and so it becomes uh, zero when you reduce mod p, and that, that's sort of the key to a lot. But um, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so then, let me turn to Iwasawa theory, because so far I haven't done any Iwasawa theory, I think, right? So, okay, so in Iwasawa theory, we have to look at a tower. Uh, John already mentioned this, so I could look at fr is q mu p to the r for r greater than or equal to 1, and f infinity would be the union of these FRs, that's the cyclotomic ZP extension of F. Um, there's the cyclotomic character, uh, which maps the Galois group. Let me call that uh, gamma tilde. I may not use it much, but I think I will. Galois group of F infinity over Q to, to, so all the way down to Q, this is isomorphic to ZP cross. And this, so this piatic cyclotomic character. And again, it, it's formed by looking at how uh, a Galois element acts on all p power roots of unity, right? And that gives you, on a given so p to the rth root of unity, that tells you what this number is, mod p to the r. Okay, so, um, right. So this, this, this gamma tilde breaks up as a direct product of two groups, one of which is gamma, and one of which is essentially the delta we've already uh, talked about. Gamma is the Galois group of F infinity over F, and it maps under the cyclotomic character to 1 plus PZP, which is sort of non-canonically isomorphic to ZP. And uh, delta is, is still the same group, but if we want to think of it as a subgroup, then we can think of it as the Galois group of F infinity over the cyclotomic ZP extension of Q. Okay, yeah. I mean, there's there are different canonical choices of isomorphisms with ZP, yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, yes. Um, OK. Uh, so in fact, I think the one I'm going to take, I actually, I'm not going to say what it is, but I'm going to take uh, right, the, the generator such that 1 minus p inverse log uh, gives you 1. But <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hmm? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, K is supposed to be uh, between P minus. Yeah. 
How's that? Okay. Um, right. So, okay. And then, uh, right, Iwasawa theory. Okay, so we have the Iwasawa algebra. We have two of them. We could take the completed group ring of uh, gamma tilde. This is, you know, just the inverse limit of the finite group rings. And so, um, okay. Uh, and, and this thing, well, and then we have the completed group ring of gamma, which is, um, well, and then how do they relate? Gamma tilde is, if you like, or sorry, lambda tilde is lambda delta. Okay. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, lambda is isomorphic to ZP uh, T for a power series ring via a choice of topological generator. Uh, yeah, I'm going to attempt to write upsilon, <laughs> but you can call it V or something or new if you want. But uh, right, as I said, um, a topological topological generator. Okay, so uh, and in fact, um, if we let gamma be the group element of this topological generator, then the isomorphism under the isomorphism. Gamma minus one is sent to T. Okay. So. Okay. Great. So. Uh, so here are three uh, lambda tilde modules. That are important. Okay, so the first is we could consider the direct limit of class groups, right, as we go up the tower. They map p parts of class groups. They map to each other. So we could look at A infinity, which is the um, direct limit of the AR, where uh, AR, I guess, is class FR tensor ZP. This is a discrete, uh, we give it a topology, it's discrete. Uh, lambda module or lambda tilde module. Um, that's one. Uh, second, we could take the inverse limit. But let me put it this way. I'll call this the unramified. I'm trying to introduce new terminology for these, but so I don't, so I don't have to write this. Um, right. So it's the. Um, uh, so it's Galois group of L infinity, oops, L infinity over F infinity for uh, L infinity, the maximal unramified abelian pro P extension of F infinity. Because usually people write that. Okay, so unramified E with solid module. Um, and, uh, right, so that's some profinite group, some compact lambda tilde module. Uh, and by class field theory, uh, X infinity is isomorphic to the inverse limit of these under norms, norm maps on ideals. Okay, and the third uh, is script X infinity, which is the P-ramified Iwasawa module. So that's the Galois group of, I'm using similar notation to John, uh, Galois group of M infinity over F infinity for uh, M infinity, uh, yeah, yeah, dot, dot, dot. And just replace the above with unramified outside 
So unramified gets replaced with unramified outside P. Okay. So again, uh, compact. Great. So what are the actually what are the actions on these groups? Uh, well, you know, Galois acts on elements, acts on ideals, and induces action on uh, ideal classes. So you can get you know action on the first or on this on, on the second half of this isomorphism here. On the, on the Galois groups, the key point is that these L infinity and M infinity are actually Galois over Q. So for instance, take L infinity. So, um, so L infinity lies over F infinity, and here we have Q. And uh, here I have X infinity, and here I have gamma tilde. So this is Galois. So if I, if I have a, I don't know, sigma in here, and tau in here, I can lift sigma to sigma tilde here, right? I choose a lifting of sigma. So uh, sigma tilde restricted to f infinity equals sigma. Now, how, how does sigma act on tau? It acts by conjugation. So uh, it maps it to the, but we have, can't conjugate by sigma. We, we can conjugate by the lift, and the choice of lift doesn't matter. And so that gives us an action, OK? That's a continuous action, actually. So, so yeah, I mean, right. The, the fact that you can write this as an inverse limit tells you that the action, for instance, of gamma tilde is continuous. And that what, that's what means you have a module over gamma tilde rather than just the group ring, right? Now here, um, because these are all compact modules, I mean, you can see that uh, also this conjugation action is continuous. And so you actually have a module over the completed group ring. Continuous and ZP linear. Okay, so uh, how do these things relate to each other? Okay, relationships. Okay, so uh, first, if I let x infinity yoda uh, be just x infinity, but now I let a Galois element act by its inverse. So I change the, I keep it the same uh, group, uh, topological group, but now I change the action, right? Uh, in fact, same ZP module, but with sigma in delta tilde acting by sigma inverse. Okay, so that's what Yoda will mean. Um, so this is pseudo isomorphic. Um, oh yeah, maybe I should have said one thing first, to A infinity. So this means uh, there's, a, there's a lambda tilde or lambda module, uh, well, it's lambda tilde module, uh, homomorphism with finite kernel and co-kernel. So what I should have said first Make it two. Um, it's not really a relationship, okay? But I'll put it here. Um, these are all. This one surjects onto that one. These are all. If I take the Pontryag and dual of a infinity, the three of these modules are then are finitely generated <coughs> lambda modules. They're finitely generated over lambda. But uh, moreover, the last two are torsion, right? And how do you see that x infinity is torsion? Let me just maybe say that out loud. Um, you have perfect control of x infinity. So if I, if I mod out by the group that uh, John was calling gamma r, then I get the ar in the nth layer. And that's a finite group. If I mod all the way down to f, I, I get uh, a1 or af. Um, but that's a finite group, again. And the fact that that group is finite implies by Nakayama, that's a torsion ZP module, implies by Nakayama's lemma that X infinity is a torsion lambda module. Okay. So uh, the third is that if I look at, uh, there's also a relationship with the minus part, which will come up in the last talk. But um, if I look at the, the plus part of X infinity, uh, script X infinity, then this is actually isomorphic to the Tate twist of the 
Pontryagin dual of the minus part of A infinity. So, um, so this is a sort of Coomer theory, a Coomer duality. Okay. So uh, let me mention uh, two results of um, uh, Iwasawa, one of Iwasawa and one of Ferrero and Washington. Um, so, so the result of uh, Iwasawa is maybe simpler, and that is that um, the maximal finite submodule of x infinity, the minus part of x infinity, right? Uh, remember, the, by Nakayama's lemma, now the plus part of this x infinity, not the script one, but the unramified Iwasawa module, is going to be, uh, well, if you believe Vandenberg's conjecture, it's zero. So let's talk about the minus part of x infinity. Um, OK, so um, the minus part of x infinity actually had, it could have some maximal finite submodule, which was the D1 that showed up in, in uh, the structure theorem. Um, but he was always showed that that's zero, so it has trivial maximal finite submodule. But it could still have P torsion. It could, it could contain something that looks like the power, it could, you know, a sub, submodule, say, or uh, that, um, that looks like the power series ring over FP. And Ferrero and Washington showed that that doesn't happen. So together, these two results say that x infinity minus contains no p torsion, uh, except zero. <laughs> OK. Um, right. And so, so what this says by the structure theorem is that x infinity minus injects into uh, a product i equal 1 to h um, lambda mod pi, where pi is a distinguished polynomial. So what does that mean? Um, that means that it's monic and congruent to t to its degree, which is called the lambda invariant, mod uh, p. And uh, we could, yeah, it doesn't have to be irreducible. Okay. Um, and so now the characteristic ideal of uh, this x infinity minus is just defined to be the product. Right. So there's a uniqueness in the structure theorem. Okay. Product like that. So that's an invariant of of lambda. Of uh, sorry, of x infinity minus. Okay, uh, so so in particular, what we have is that x infinity minus as a as a um, ZP module is finitely generated uh, free over ZP of some rank. Okay, so uh, now let me turn to uh, p-adic L functions or L functions. So p-adic L functions. OK, so suppose I have a, a character of delta, or z mod pz cross, say, into q bar cross. Um, so this gives us a, a primitive Dirichlet character. So that means a function from z factoring through z mod pz to q bar cross, uh, which we'll also call chi. Um, that uh, right, we take to be to make it primitive means that um, we'll take this chi of p to be zero if chi is not one, and one if chi is one. We kind of want to avoid chi is one for the most part. But okay, uh, so so the L series that we look at. Is this? Um, analogous and it converges for real part of S greater than one, and then we have a meromorphic uh, analytic, if chi is not one, continuation to C. Um, and and 
the point is that this L chi 1 minus n is actually an interesting number, much like the zeta of 1 minus n is an interesting number. And you can take this to be the definition, if you like, since I didn't define generalized Bernoulli number. Uh, it matches with the previous definition for B1. It's some generalized Bernoulli number for chi, nth generalized Bernoulli number for chi over n and with a minus sign. So this lies in the, uh, I don't know, the field given by uh, joining the values of chi to q. OK. Um, right, so some generalized Bernoulli number. OK, so now the key point is that this is some algebraic number. So I, if I think of q bar as sitting inside qp bar, then, then I can compose my chi with it, and then I get that chi, at least restricted to z mod pz cross, is going to be omega to the i for some i, uh, some i. So let's, let's assume that i is even. OK. Um, so right. So now the point is that um, the values uh, of, if I define, so I'm going to make a definition here. LP chi 1 minus n, oh yeah, didn't leave enough space, uh, is So I form a new primitive character there, chi omega to the minus n. Uh, right, the values, uh, these values, they, they vary nicely, OK? Uh, so if I slightly modify my L values, they, they vary nicely. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Um, if uh, n is congruent to m mod p to the r minus 1, p minus 1. Uh, let's just suppose chi is not 1. Uh, then then um, lp chi 1 minus n is congruent to lp chi 1 minus m uh, mod p to the r. OK. So, uh, so from this, you could conclude that there exists, uh, well, a, a, a well-defined function of ZP, or in fact, a, a p-adic analytic function, um, continuous function, which takes p-adic values. This sort of interpolates these values at positive n greater than equal, right, positive n. Uh, OK, great. So that's called the Kubota-Leopold p-adic L function. Maybe I should write that somewhere. Uh, OK, Kubota-Leopold p-adic L function. Great. So my goal here is to state the main conjecture. You might be. Wondering so, and to say a little more. Um, okay, so uh, so one key point about this LP chi s is that it's given by a measure on ZP cross. In fact, uh, if I define uh, phi n to be some awful thing, uh, p to the n minus one. This is coming from the first Bernoulli polynomial. And then here is group element, group element. So this is in ZP. This is a minus of the Stickelberger element. Um, then, I, then these things are compatible. And I can take their inverse limit in the completed group ring. And, uh, and so this gives me an element of lambda tilde. Now, if I look at um, the projection of this to one of the eigenspaces under the action of delta, because this thing, like any ZP delta module, breaks up as a direct sum of p minus 1 eigenspaces. So I can project it, if you like, to the 1 minus kth eigenspace. And that will give me an element of lambda. Uh, so let's say that k is even and 
not congruent to zero. Um, then, then it turns out that this thing, if I plug in my new, my chosen generator to the S minus one, I get LP omega to the K S. So, so in other words, what I get by my isomorphism of, la of lambda with ZP, the power series ring, is I get a power series, right? So now I've plugged in a value uh, that gives us the values of this piatic L function. And that's very nice, because now I can state uh, the Iwasawa main conjecture. Which was proven by Mazur and Wiles in 1984. Oh yeah, there. This is infinity. Mm -hmm. Oh, here. This is this is an S, and this is a K. That's my uh, upsilon, uh, right? <laughs> That's my chosen generator of one plus P Z P. That I yeah. That it will be fixed throughout the four talks. Okay. So uh, you can take it to be one plus p if you like that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so the characteristic ideal uh, of this one minus kth eigenspace, this odd eigenspace, right, contributing the minus part, um, is equal to the ideal generated by f k. Oh, I should have said what f k is. F k is so this is k even. It's this element if k is not zero mod p minus one, and you know this may not be the most natural thing, but let's take it to be one if k is uh, zero mod p minus one. Okay. So uh, the the case that k is zero is easy, so we'll kind of ignore that. Um, okay. So in the remaining five minutes, I want to try to mention a few equivalent forms of the of the main conjecture. Okay. So the first is that um, if I look, well I said that A infinity was pseudo isomorphic when I take its Pontryagin dual to um, to uh, X infinity. So you might ask, what is the characteristic ideal of A infinity 1 minus K? Well, that's going to be generated by some HK, where HK of nu to the S minus 1 is LP omega K minus S. Okay. That's what the Pontryagin dual switches the S to minus S. The that's easy. Um, the second one is that if I look at the characteristic idea of X infinity now, remember that the Coomer duality was between plus and minus parts, and then there was a Tate twist. So 1 minus K becomes K. And, and so that'll be generated by some GK, where GK of epsilon to the S minus 1 is LP omega to the k 1 minus s. OK. And uh, the third is maybe the most interesting. Uh, so if I now take the inverse limit of the p units of these various rings under norms, so write out what that is. And I, I'll p complete them at each stage. So you can just do that by tensoring with zp. And inside there, I have the cyclotomic p units. Um, so I'll just write, you know, it'd be the inverse limit of the group generated by the 1 minus zeta p to the r, or n, I guess I used n there, n um, i, i, p does not divide i. And then I have the group, um, which is the inverse limit of local uh, fields. Local at p. I can take their multiplicative groups. I can't tensor them by zp to make them uh, uh, 
uh, complete. So instead of writing a hat or something, I'll just put p length powers here. This is also under norms. Um, then, uh, then actually I have an exact sequence, which was sort of mentioned, but now I'm going to take the quotient of it by um, C infinity. So this is kind of at the end, and at the finite level in, in John's talk. OK. Um, I'm using weak Leopold. OK. So uh, great. Um, so well, now I'll take k, k eigenspaces, right? K, k eigenspaces, omega to the k eigenspaces. So, um, so there's a theorem of Iwasawa. And that is that if I look at this u infinity mod c infinity, and I take the, some even eigenspace k, then this thing is actually isomorphic. Well, this u infinity is isomorphic to lambda, the kth eigenspace. And so c infinity, um, 1 minus zeta goes to a gener sort of generates the c infinity, 1 minus a compatible sequence of 1 minus p power roots of unity uh, generates this c infinity as a lambda modulus. And, and so what is the image of c infinity? They're both free of rank 1 over lambda, uh, it's this, this gk, the ideal generated by this gk, is what we get for the quotient. OK, so um, that occurred there at the top. Great, but that tells you that the main conjecture, right? the main conjecture is saying that the characteristic ideal of this, the kth eigenspace, and the characteristic ideal of this are the same. Now, by an Euler characteristic type argument, uh, characteristic ideals work, you know, alternating sum of characteristic ideals and exact sequences, product is one. So um, that tells you that the main conjecture holds if and only if the characteristic ideal of this E infinity is the same as the characteristic ideal of this X infinity in the kth eigenspace. So, so the main conjecture if and only if E infinity mod C infinity oh, characteristic ideal equals the characteristic ideal of x infinity k. So let me just end by, uh, so that's the third, or how many, third of the fourth equivalent form, I guess. Uh, but notice that the thing on the right-hand side is supposed to be finite, which means this characteristic ideal is supposed to be 1. And also the same thing uh, on the left, in fact, so um, let me point out that there's a weaker form of, of Vandiver's conjecture, which is called Greenberg's conjecture. It's due to Greenberg. Maybe here. Um, here. Anyway, uh, Greenberg's conjecture. Uh, and that is that uh, x infinity k is finite. So that's a little weaker than being 0. Uh, it turns out that this actually implies that e infinity mod c infinity k is 0. So under Greenberg's conjecture, this, the main conjecture holds. OK, so as long as we knew, if we knew this is finite, then the main conjecture uh, already holds. And in fact, um, just one consequence of Greenberg's conjecture, um, uh, of Green. So if it actually holds, then you can see by working out the, um, well, working through certain of these exact sequences, that the 1 minus kth eigenspace, so this is a generalization of what might be called uh, Leopold's uh, reflection principle, which is some generalization for particular eigenspaces of the, of the fact that the class group is trivial if and only if the minus part is trivial. That was due to Coomer. Um, so there's some relationship between the, the kth eigenspace and the 1 minus kth eigenspace. Um, and so Greenberg's can, so for instance, if xk, x infinity k was 0, then this thing turns out to be cyclic. If it's finite, then this thing turns out to inject into lambda mod fk with finite co-kernel. OK, pseudo, injective pseudo-isomorphism. Uh, so if we just knew Greenberg's conjecture, then the main conjecture would be a lot easier. Uh, we'd already be uh, done. But, uh, and it should be true. But 
Okay, so that's it for this talk. Questions? Hi, this might be a dumb one, but the uh, when you write the when the V is conjecture, you say uh, if A F plus is zero, if and only if A F minus is zero, then you wrote A F plus is always zero. That's a conjecture. But then A F is always zero, and so everything is regular. Um, I'm, um, am I missing something? No. So so let me see what I wrote. Uh, I wrote that um, A F is zero if and only if A F minus is zero. But that oh. doesn't mean A F plus is a uh, right. Uh, oh, okay. See, A F is zero. Okay. I yeah. See. I see. Oh, right. Yeah. And uh, on the last page, is that a C infinity over C infinity or? Uh, where? Where? Uh, last page. The here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's E, right? That's E. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? So in the first part of our talk, you talk about the Herbrand Ribes theorem. Yes. And in the second part, you talk about Iwazawa theory. Yes. So what's the exact relationship between these two? Well, uh, yeah. So this main conjecture. Um, okay. So one key point of Iwazawa. Uh, well, okay. That here is we sort of have exact control. And what do I mean by exact control? I mean that um, if I take uh, well, in particular, if I if I take uh, x infinity gamma, so the co-invariant group, so this is the maximal quotient of x infinity on which gamma acts trivially, then I recover a f. Okay, so if I know something about the structure of x infinity, that tells me something about the structure of a f. And in fact, you can see that the the that the main conjecture or the Iwasawa main conjecture implies the, the result of Mazur and Wiles that I mentioned earlier, that the AF 1 minus K, the order is P to the, this number. Because this number is a value of the piatic L function, right, that occurs in the main conjecture. So, um, right, so, so the main conjecture is sort of a generalization of what you see at this sort of first stage, but you see it all the way up the tower now here. It's a lot stronger. Okay, uh, let's take a break and reconvene at 11.30.